people, um, and I guess good evening for everyone around the world. Um, it's great to be able to share sort of our journey and, and what we've been doing uh, within Gal School um, as part of the, the NetHope grant. Um, obviously, uh, as a school, we are, work very closely with, with youth of all ages. Um, and so I just want to talk through a bit about what we've been doing, how we've been doing it, um, and some of the challenges that we've faced as well. Um, so if you scroll down, Amelia, uh, I'll start with a very brief uh, introduction uh, about who we are, what we're doing, where we're doing it, and why we're doing it. Um, Gal School is basically a, a low-cost private school based in Cusco in Peru. Um, we are a local family who were basically unhappy with the... the Peru's known globally for having very poor education results, low down in, in the piece comparison done by the OECD. Um, and we are based in Cusco, um, so very high up, about three level. The area is really rich in culture. I mean, the whole of Latin America, but specifically Peru and Cusco. Um, the economy here is mostly based on tourism and resource extraction. Really, the country suffers from a level of uh, inequalities. Lima, the capital, which has another success. And you have the rural areas. So, as a country, Peru has Growth of sort of five, six percent for the last um, But in the rural areas, you know, you still have people dying of cold, uh, um, essentially. So, a really, really diverse country, uh, a middle income country, which brings with it its own challenges. Um, and we are working di both directly with the middle class, um, who are students mostly in the school, and also through social projects. So my role is to basically work with the school and also take the best of the school out to rural areas. So our methodologies, what the teachers do. If we scroll down to the next slide, um, basically the first question that we were kind of asked was how are we encouraging young people to Really for us, uh, the means to an end, uh, and for us it's one of uh, a couple of different tools we have at our disposition and that we use. So within the school, we use it as a part of the learning approach, so basically encouraging children to support a high level, uh, the four steps that we've, we've used to do this, uh, you can see listed there. So the first thing we've always done is really inspire the children, the youth, to really understand how they can change their society. Um, we've used a lot of examples from the OSM community globally, um, which I'll touch on in just a minute, uh, and really sort of showed them a range of different tools that are available, some of which they were familiar with and some of which they weren't. Um, the second point there is really much less focused on the, the technology and much more focused on a mentality that they have. So really empowering them to understand um, how they can change uh, their society, how they can create social impact, and then supporting them uh, and enabling them to do that, both, both through, uh, obviously, the tools, so in this case, uh, mobile phones, um, internet connection, uh, and laptops, but also through training, so training to map, training to use those tools, and mentoring. Uh, one of the things that we've seen has been really important to keep the youth engaged has been really having that um, ongoing support both from myself and from the various teams as well. Um, and the final point I'll say there, which is important, is that we really needed to align with the curriculum. But something they can do um, as part of their everyday. Next slide, um, if you're able to move on to um, the, the sort of question around how or what of our approach has been to train young people. Really, it's very similar to what I just explained. So, first of all, understanding what we did 
um, initially in the first session with, with all of our groups was really show them videos from some of the other projects familiar with them, which we think is relevant. So, so some of the great work in Agua, Tanzania, Mozambique, um, as well as some other projects that weren't really run through HOT or, or don't necessarily have a, an open street map connection, but which I thought or we thought were relevant given the uh, situation here in Cusco. So Google have an open heritage project, and Plan International had a, an interesting free to be project um, mapping um, gender violence. So after showing them those examples, we really stimulated discussions um, around understanding similarities and differences to the context that the students live in. Uh, um, to get them excited and to get them to really understand what was possible uh, and what people were already doing. The second stage was to train them in the basic tools so they could see how easy it is to map using something like maps.me um, or Mapillary uh, or ID Editor so they could really see this was something that they can do. Um, and then the third thing was to really uh, uh, really, I guess, formalize and, and make concrete the social challenges that they identified in their society. Instead of, instead of starting from a point of, we are going to map this, it was much more, okay, let's have a discussion around what you'd like to change about your society and let's work out particular to drive that change uh, and then really formalizing that in, into a work plan um, to encourage them to really stick to uh, concrete tasks uh, so that they can deliver uh, projects to the timelines uh, and then the final stage there obviously the execution of their projects um, as some examples that I'll touch on uh, in just a minute in terms of uh, mapping for gender awareness, uh, approving transport, the semi-formal transport system here. Um, the next question, um, if we go down uh, to the next slide, um, was around um, our process for ensuring that you understand the impact of the debt and how it can be used for um, So really, as you can see, Really, the, the key thing for us has been to make, um, so rather than making this is academic or theoretical world, we've really made this as personal as possible. Three key things I, I'd probably highlight, I would highlight as examples of this. So number one in the top left is experiential learning. So one of the things that we believe very strongly in uh, in school is learning through experience. So you can see, hopefully, um, in there from Gal, who have talked to a community that lives along that. I think trail at about 4,000 um, which are a rural in poverty, poor nutrition. What I do is rather than just show children um, in a book or in a video what it's like to live there, it's really take them there to understand what those realities are like. And obviously as part of that, what you can do or what we did was say, okay, we're going to this community, how are we going to get there? Let's have a look on the map. Oh, it doesn't appear on the map. The, the trail, the path there doesn't appear on the map. Even the school isn't mapped. And to really drive a discussion around why is that? Why hasn't this community been prioritized? Why isn't it on the map? And what are the implications of that for things like government planning, for things like uh, tourism revenue um, and things like that? And then to really, once you've had those discussions, go and understand and talk to the people and, and see how that has impacted their lives. Um, on a day is just below, um, really taking advantage of all situations. Um, so there you can see two people mapping, this was on another school trip, where, um, where one teacher had to arrive late, basically. And the place where we were staying wasn't mapped, he got lost, he didn't know how to get there, and he was left wandering around the village at, uh, at one in the morning, a rural village. Um, and we really used that, again, as an example to engage the, 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 the youth, the children, in, in understanding. Um, why wasn't that village mapped? Why wasn't the place that we were staying mapped? 
and a very tangible example of the implications of not having somewhere on the map for someone that they know and they interact with on a daily basis. The third uh, example, which I'll, I'll highlight, um, is on the right path for a, a, a very dressed white woman uh, is doing advertising at car wash in Peru. And that is exactly the question that we've been stimulating uh, with children. So, veo, pienso, y me pregunto. Uh, it's basically a methodology that we use within the school, which in English means I see, I think, and I ask myself. And this is uh, an example of how we've engaged uh, children on a day to day basis with mapping. So, here, one of the multiple examples of sexism is the fact that a lot of the car washes are basically advertised by white women in bikinis. And obviously, there aren't any white women in bikinis working in those car washes. And those, the majority of those white women in bikinis aren't breathing either. And so, what we've done is really used that to stimulate um, discussion around, you know, what are the implications of those gender and racial stereotypes? Why are they used? Why are they accurate representations through whom people used? And we've all of the different images um, that they understand uh, and to drive a conversation within their class around um, racial uh, and sexual stereotypes within Cusco and understanding where those differ across the, the city. Um, very conscious that I am already using up um, very quick um, for the next slide. Um, success stories, um, I think it's probably mentioned that um, we've only been really implementing our grants since April, um, so we're still at a very... Um, I'd probably highlight the examples of uh, interesting solutions to out or more interesting projects for children. Um, first of all, empowering grade nine girls, which is the project I've spent there to start to map um, areas where they see gender stereotypes. And there is really under, uh, encouraging a deeper. So here we've been working with um, grade eight, uh, a grade eight class who wanted to map uh, what we want to map some of the areas that are less well known within the region. Um, the region has a lot of tourism, lots of people come to, to experience ruins, but that money is not divided equally across society. And there are lots of areas which are basically just missed from there because they're not known about and they're not highlighted by the big tourism agencies. So they've been exploring those and starting to map those with an idea of improving their own understanding of their the less well known parts of the culture with a long-term goal of also trying to, to drive some more tourism to those areas to improve the socio-economic situation. Um, and then the final box there has really been a byproduct of the, the processes that we've done. Um, as I mentioned at the start, there's a lot of inequality in Peru. Um, and what we have been able to do through a lot of the mapping activities is um, have youth from the sort of uh, middle classes working with youth from other socioeconomic classes, so from rural areas, from other realities, and using maps as a tool for them to share their realities with each other, you know, be that a community mapping exercise, as you can see at the top, um, or be that, you know, showing people what the realities are like uh, in other places as well. And that's been quite powerful to see youth attitudes change just through those. Uh, and that's certainly something that we hope to focus on more uh, in the future as well. Um, and then the final slide, which I, I'd hope to, to highlight, um, was really just uh, some of the challenges that we've been able to scroll down uh, again, Amelia. Um, basically, as I said, we're at a very early stage of our implementation and we've got a long learning. We really focused on the leadership role, which has been great, but it has meant that we've had to be a certainty, um, both in terms of what youth want to focus on, even if certain age driving projects. And that's been a real learning point for us as well, that working in some areas with, the, with particularly low education results 
even with the older children and sort of grade uh, 9, 10, 11, it's been very challenging to get them to, um, to, to think and to challenge themselves about why they want to map, uh, how they can change in society. It's been a real, real interesting experience for, for us as teachers to really challenge them to think in a, in a way that's obviously completely new to them. I think we might have lost you, Pete. Can you still hear us? Uh, and then because you named we can't that, hear you now. Oh. oh, I think you've just come back. Already protected, so you don't need to change around if if um, you had a form issue. Um, sorry, did you lose me for a minute there? Yeah, you you're back now. <laughs> That's great. You hear me? Now? I've probably run over my lot of time. Um, and yeah, I guess the last two things there were just. I think we've lost sound again, Pete. Um, if you can still speak and we can still hear you, um, I just wondered if you had any questions to the wider OSM community about challenges potentially you're facing running youth programmes that you'd like to ask to the broader community and if anyone had any questions for Pete on, on the project in Peru. Okay, well, if no one has any questions for now, um, feel free to post them in the oh, in the box, um, and we can have a longer discussion at the end. Um, do we have Koken on the line from OSM Liberia? Yeah, done.